Greetings, comrades! It is believed that fast food came to the Soviet Union at about the same time as all the other corrupting influences of the West, in the late 1980s. And the symbol of this victorious arrival of buns with patties to the socialist world was the opening of the first McDonald's on Pushkin Square in Moscow on January 21, 1990. But this is not really the case. In the Soviet Union there was a fairly well-developed system of establishments where a Soviet citizen could have a quick and tasty meal at lunchtime or after a hard day's work. And if there was no desire to go to any indoor facility to do so, you could always buy a snack right on the street. Even burgers in the USSR appeared not in 1990, but in 1937. How was it all organized and what exactly could an ordinary Soviet person buy? Let's find out. In fact, at the dawn of the Soviet Union, the Bolsheviks devoted a lot of time on the issue of organized collective dining in big cities. There was an obvious pragmatic reason for this. Food was hard to come by in the villages at that time, while in the cities more and more new places were constantly opening where you could get your first and second courses and dessert. Yeah, you guessed it. It was one of the ways of transferring labor from the countryside to the cities. I've talked about it in my collectivization video, for example. But in the 1920s it was more of a part of the fundamental reorganization of the Soviet citizens' everyday life. According to the Bolsheviks' idea, a Soviet man was not supposed to do practically anything at home at all. In particular, a woman was supposed to be freed from kitchen slavery. All this was to be left to the state. For this purpose, for example, huge factory kitchens were built, the purpose of which was not only to feed workers, employers and students, but also to turn the joint meal into a mass cultural event. Unfortunately, this unique concept never really caught on. So, from the 1930s onwards, catering establishments became a bit more like what we see today. As I have already said, organizing the statewide food service system was one of the most important tasks of the Bolsheviks after they came to power. Food was seen as a way of reproducing labor force and keeping this labor force in good spirits. At the same time, the main goal was to feed the people, not to please them with exquisite cuisine. So the dishes in these establishments as a rule were not always tasty, but healthy and compliant with sanitary norms. Food was seen as a simple combination of fats, proteins and carbohydrates. Now, this was generally the principle the young Soviet Union adhered to until the 1950s. The first establishments bore little resemblance to modern fast food chains based on Western models. Soviet cafeterias usually served a set meal that included a salad, soup, main course, bread and a glass of tea or compote. In addition to such establishments, there were also fast food outlets, where you could buy a pie, a bagel or other quick snack. They replaced the pre-revolutionary peddlers, who most often worked near markets and train stations. Fine dining was considered a bourgeois relic. Nevertheless, Soviet leaders constantly tried to improve the organization of public catering. In 1934, the People's Committee of Food Industry was founded and its head, Anastas Mikoyan, went to the United States to learn from them. He wanted to give bland, standardized and industry-produced food a pleasant taste. And obviously, what could he see in the US? A hamburger, of course. I familiarized myself with the activities of New York cafeterias, the famous Macy's department store and retail stores selling gastronomic goods. Our attention was attracted by the mass machine production of standard patties, which were sold hot with a bun, the so-called hamburgers, right on the street, in special kiosks. I ordered samples of machines producing such patties, as well as street fryers. In 1937 we transferred this experience to some of our major cities – Moscow, Leningrad, Baku, Kharkov and Kyiv. So McDonald's in 1990? A Soviet man could eat a real burger even before World War II. Special kiosks were set up in crowded places in big cities, especially in parks. Soviet hamburgers were called hot Moscow cutlet. You fry the patty on a shopping cart and put it between two buns, a ready-made treat for a proletarian enjoying the beautiful weather in a park of culture and leisure. 
However, the idea of American bonds somehow failed to catch on. Proletarians preferred to put a cutlet between two slices of ordinary bread, black or white. The same Mikoyan brought something else from the US, the idea of a cafeteria with self-service and a wide range of soft drinks. But instead of Coca-Cola, mass production of kvass and lemonade was launched in the Soviet country. But the war brought its own corrections. The public catering industry went back 20 years. And Nikita Khrushchev had to build the system anew. It was under Nikita Sergeyevich that Soviet fast food developed its unique image. Not just a working cafeteria that would give you a cutlet with a bun and a glass of lemonade, but something absolutely authentic. But it was still slightly influenced by the US, in a way. In 1959 Nikita Khrushchev visited America and was fascinated by the IBM cafeteria, where he tried a hot dog. This unpretentious food did not leave Nikita Khrushchev indifferent, and he ordered to include the hot dog in the Soviet menu. This is how the sausage in dough appeared in the USSR. In general, the peculiarity of public catering under Khrushchev and the Soviet Union was that there were many small establishments that focused on a single dish. Of course, there were still cafes, restaurants and factory cafeterias where the range of dishes was extremely wide. But all this has nothing to do with fast food. That's why people came for a full multi-course meal. And for a quick snack, small, highly specialized establishments have popped up everywhere. They were even named after the dishes. Sosisochne, pelmenne, blinne, pirashkove, ponchikove, butterbrodne, shashlichne, chiburechne, and, of course, rumochne. The Soviet republics had their own types of establishments. Chekhana, Samsankana, Lagmankana where local cuisine was served, noodles, meat pies, tea with sweets, and so on. What did all these dishes have in common? They were not difficult to produce, they were quick to cook, and they were as cheap and hearty as possible. Just what you need for a quick pick-me-up. In addition, they did not contain any rare ingredients that might suddenly be in short supply. Let's go through the most popular of these establishments. Let's start, of course, with the Chiburechny. Chibureki quickly became one of the most popular quick meals in the USSR and spread throughout its territory. But in fact, it is a traditional Crimean Tatar pastry, a triangular dough with minced meat inside. The word Chiburek means meat pie in Crimean Tatar. All Chiburechny in the USSR looked about the same. A small room, a counter and five, six high tables in front of it. And where are the chairs? There weren't any. This is fast food. Come, get it, eat it in 5 minutes, move on. If you didn't want meat, but wanted something sweet, they were ponchkovy or pyshechne. Both ponchik and pyshka were dough products fried in oil, filled with berries or sprinkled with powdered sugar. The only difference was the location – ponchkovy in Moscow and pyshechne in St. Petersburg. In general, all these dishes are actually variations of a donut fried in a lot of oil. Not the healthiest food. Another similarity to American fast food. The only thing that differed was the portions. They were traditionally not very large, unlike those giant Big Macs. If you wanted something a little healthier, you could have butterbrodny, for example. Butterbrod is open sandwich in Russian, and a sandwich is fast food, right? There's Subway, after all. Except that in the USSR, sandwich shops had their own specifics, and their second name was Rumichny, basically shot shops. Yeah, sandwiches were never just served independently, only in establishments with alcohol. In fact, it was the Soviet answer to Western bars, but with peculiarities. There was no variety of alcohol, usually only vodka, very rarely cognac or other strong alcohol. Vodka was poured into 50 gram shots and each was accompanied by an open sandwich. The sandwiches were usually with sausage, boiled eggs, salted fish, quite a traditional snack. The pivni beer halls were organized on the same principle, except that instead of sandwiches there were sushki, dried fish or sausages. Actually, even Soviet bars have their own ideological mission to accustom citizens to a more cultural drinking of alcohol, not on a playground or in a park, but in a specialized eatery. And finally, if you wanted to please yourself with something exquisite, they were pilmenne or shashlichne to choose from. 
However, Soviet pilmenny did not serve dumplings made of different exotic meats and did not offer dozens of various sauces. Dumplings everywhere were the same, produced by the Anstankene meat processing plant, and one portion of pilmeni cost exactly 32 kopecks everywhere. There was always salt and pepper on the table, as well as vinegar in a bottle mixed with mustard. By the way, just as in Chiburechny, Rumichny and Pivny, there were no chairs, everything was done standing up. On the round tabletop was a shelf where you could put your bag or briefcase to free your hand for eating. And finally, Shashlichne. They were usually found only in large cities or resort towns. When you walked past them, the aroma of fried meat was so strong that you literally drooled. Again, there were simply no exotic spices and sauces in the USSR. Shashlik marinade everywhere consists of diluted vinegar, onions, salt and pepper. Another distinction of shashlik shops was the cellars. Of course, they were all exclusively from the Caucasian republics. Closer to the 70s, the USSR also saw the emergence of unique Minutka cafes. What was their uniqueness? Well, the fact that they were all exactly the same. The same name, signboard, location, Paco Square, assortment, even the scowling saleswoman behind the counter, they were all the same. Here you could buy the same chibureki, pies, pastries, donuts, juices and hot drinks. There was a small courtyard next to the cafe. In the warm season, the tables were taken outside and the guests had a choice of where to sit. Yes, you could sit there. A huge breakthrough for Soviet fast food. But that's not all, is it? Why go somewhere stuffy and crowded when there is such a thing as street food? Buy what you need, sit on a bench in the park and have lunch. You could do that, couldn't you? Yes, of course. In general, the idea of street food was widespread rather in Tsarist Russia, where a variety of food from street vendors was one of the main attributes of any fair. If we are talking about unique things, it would probably be a rooster on a stick. What in sugar assembled into a whimsical shape, any child's joy was assured. If we talk about the Soviet products that were sold on the streets, there were also some unique things. First of all, of course, there are the soft drink vending machines. Inside the metal case there was a mechanism for cooling the water, a cylinder with carbon dioxide, containers with one or more syrups and a dispenser, by means of which the drink was delivered into a glass. The device was connected to the power grid and the city water supply. And yes, there were no plastic cups in them. So lemonade was poured into the same glass cup, which had to be washed there, under special faucet. And no one was squeamish. For one kopeck you could buy a serving of pure water, for free with syrup. A Soviet citizen could cool down in the heat not only with soda, but also with kvass. However, kvass machines were not invented. The drink spoils after a day or two, so it was delivered around the city in special yellow barrels next to which stood a lady in a white coat and poured kvass to the thirsty. As soon as a barrel of kvass appeared somewhere in the city in summer, there was immediately a line for it. By the way, this barrel gave birth to one of the strangest urban legends of the USSR. Every city had this legend. One day, residents of one micro-district complained about the unpleasant taste of kvass from a yellow barrel. In a country where all food is strictly regulated by ghosts, this is really an emergency. So they called the police, who opened the barrel and found a corpse at the bottom. How it got there remains unknown. Whether it really happened too, but such a story was told in absolutely every city. By the way, sometimes the yellow barrel carried a more pleasant surprise. You see a familiar yellow vessel, but the inscription on the side is different. Not kvass, but beer. What a joy. But it was a very rare occurrence. But there was more diversity. There were only four varieties of kvass in the USSR, but more than 300 varieties of beer. At the same time, light beer was much more popular than dark beer. If we talk about food, not drinks, then the only treat that could somehow be called street food was boiled corn. And yes, again a big shout out to Nikita Khrushchev, the biggest corn fan in the world. It was sold mainly in southern resorts. 
On the Black Sea beaches, local vendors were always walking between people and selling corn cobs with salt. And of course, we can't forget about Soviet ice cream. The product was so iconic that its fans are even being mocked today for it. Yes, ice cream in the Soviet Union was really good. Waffle cups, briquettes and Eskimo all over the country were made according to the same technology and contained only milk fat, possessing a rich dairy flavor without any preservatives. Soviet-era ice cream was sold in small shops, cafes and little kiosks outside. Plus, Soviet ice cream was one of the few products the USSR exported and was so good that even foreign tourists said that there were three reasons to visit the Soviet Union. Watching ballet, going to the circus and tasting the ice cream. Then came Perestroika and it all went into oblivion. And the ice cream became less tasty because ghosts are now not so strict and the soft drink vending machines were thrown away and the rumishne closed down. McDonald's and Burger Kings came instead and shawarma became the main street food instead of corn. Is that a bad thing? No, because we must admit that all these foods and establishments had their disadvantages, mainly related to the scarcity of the assortment. And yet, in recent years, cafes that mimic Soviet eateries have become more and more common. So, even now you can visit Russia and see Soviet-style establishments with a big red star and the name Chiburechne and Pilmenne. Go there and feel like a simple Soviet worker for a while. Well, except that you'll probably be allowed to sit while eating. That is all for today, and as always, a huge thank you to Stick to One, Yelizaveta Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, Jordan Lamotte, Jimmy Albin, Ellie, and Peter Illich. See you guys in two weeks.